Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. I'm Sophie Line. We're at the National Armor and Cavalry Collection here at Fort Benning in Georgia and I'm here with one of the dedicated volunteers from the team and we're going to show you a new vehicle today. Hello everybody, it's Bill again uh, from the National Armor and Cavalry Collection. I'm one of the volunteer mechanics here. Uh, today we're going to talk about a slightly different vehicle I'm used to talking about which is the BMP2. Now the BMP2 is the second iteration of the BMP series. Of course, it started with the BMP1. Uh, this one has a lot of very different features than the BMP1 had. It also has some of the same features, especially in the hull. So this vehicle came out about 1986, 1988, used extensively by the Soviet Union, also a lot of Warsaw Pact countries, uh, Middle East. Uh, it's probably one of the most proliferated, proliferated vehicles in the world. Uh, and just so everybody knows, I am not a BMP2 expert. So when I get something wrong, kind of take it with a grain of salt. Okay, so we're gonna start a little walk around here. Of course, this is the BMP2. One of the first things you notice between the two and the one series, of course, is the size of the turret. Now, the early BMP1, of course, had a one-man turret, had a 73 millimeter man gun, fired an AT4 missile off the top. Now, the BMP2, they went to a two-man turret, shooting a 30 millimeter automatic cannon, with an AT-5 missile system on the top, which of course you can see right now is somewhat missing, but we'll rectify that as, as time goes by. Uh, I'm gonna start up here at the front and just point out some, some of the things that are the same, some of the things that are different. Okay, so the basic hull of the vehicle is much like the BMP-1. It's slightly higher, it's got a very high ground clearance. Uh, the tracks are the same, the basic hull retains the same shape, uh, same power plant, same, entrance and egress doors. Uh, but what makes this vehicle different, uh, which is kind of exciting for us, but not may maybe not so much for you, are the fenders. Now, when you look at a lot of BMPs, it's just a standard thin piece of sheet metal that extends out over the tracks uh, just to keep down on dust and also help propel it to the water because it is amphibious. Uh, these fenders are actual originals and what it is they're almost a foot thick, they're full of foam. So that foam increases the buoyancy of the vehicle in the water. It's the only vehicle we have in the collection that still retained its original fenders. I know it doesn't sound exciting, but it's just one of those neat little isms. So uh, the trim vane here, uh, just like any other vehicle, the trim vane is made to fold out, helps it keep a nose up attitude when it enters the water, that way it just doesn't plow down under and of course helps it with buoyancy. Uh, here right in the front you have the, the driver's station, of course behind him is the two-man turret with the 30 millimeter auto cannon and the missile launcher. Right behind the driver would be the dismount squad leader. So he's the guy that jumps out with all the guys that live in the back until they make contact. On the turret itself, uh, the standard Soviet style smoke grenade launchers, uh, three on each side for a total of six. Uh, the gunner's primary sight is right up there. Next to that is a, is a daylight searchlight. Over on the other side is an IR searchlight for night operations. So you have the 30 millimeter auto cannon. Next to it would be for the coaxial machine gun. Gunner on the left, vehicle commander on the right, which we'll go over that as we get inside. Uh, just kind of show how cramped and, and how much is actually in there. Uh, and then down the whole side here, you have three holes. These are for the infantry inside to fire their weapons in combat from the protection of the vehicle. So this one, you notice it's larger than this one and that one. That is for the machine gunner. There's actually a special mount that you'll see once we get in there that he mounts his machine gun in there. And then these two guys right here are just firing their standard AK-47s or AK-74s. So continuing on, uh, standard BMP track. Now, Unlike some of the other amphibious vehicles the Soviets have, this one doesn't use any kind of propulsion in the water as, as far as like a, uh, a water jet or an extra propeller. It actually uses the tracks to move the water to propel the vehicle forward. And that's why there's these sl slats back here to draw in water and actually force the water around the tracks, therefore allowing it to propel itself forward. Okay. Getting to the back doors here. I have one open, one closed. There's a reason for that. I've only been able to get one open so far. 
still working on the one on the right side. Now, this vehicle looks rough. Uh, a lot of rust and things like that, but what makes this vehicle great is it is so complete. Rust can be sanded away, paint can be applied, but to actually have a vehicle that is as complete as this one is great for us because then we're not trying to scavenge parts from other vehicles to, to bring it up to 100%. So the back doors, real simple, two doors, and it retains the same as the BMP1 and everybody gets all excited about this. Those rear doors are actually the fuel tanks. So yes, that is, there is truth to that. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like that because it gets hit, there's explosions, there's fire, but just think when these are empty, that's spaced armor for the rear of the vehicle. So of course, the other side. Now, as you'll notice on this one, there is another firing port for the guy in the back that opens up and that's for his AK-47. Now the one on this side doesn't have one. I don't have a reasoning behind that, except that maybe all they needed was, was one machine gun facing to the rear. Uh, it also has two top hatches for the crew to, to stick out and stretch their legs uh, on long road marches. Of course, they'll close those before they go into contact. Uh, you look down the right side of the vehicle, it's basically a mirror image of the left side. Of course, machine gun port up front, the two AK-47 ports, uh, the same fenders, the same smoke grenade launchers, and there is the IR spotlight up there on the vehicle commander's hatch. So with that, we'll dive inside. Okay, so here, here we are in the back of the BMP2. Uh, nice shady spot, plenty of legroom as you can see. Now, the, the people who designed this vehicle really didn't care much for crew comfort. Because when you think about it, you've got all these guys lined up. And I'm six foot tall, so maybe I'm a little tall for your standard crewman. But this is how they sat. The rifle between their legs, and then of course, the ports for their weapons. So on a long road march, this could become rather troublesome uh, for, for tall people. So as I was talking about the fire imports before, so that's an AK-47 fire import. That's an AK-47 fire import. This is the fire import for the actual machine gun. And you'll see all it is is a simple system. This part comes out, it slides, it goes around the AK-47. Then when you put it back in, it locks into place and they just, look out their periscopes, which are not in right now, and fire their weapon. So these were made to mount to the side and the whole idea was to hopefully vent the gases coming off the weapon to the outside. That way they weren't back here choking and wheezing and carrying on. So now up here is the machine gun mount. Once again, doesn't look like much, but it's kind of nice that it's here. Uh, same idea, but you mounted an actual machine gun in here. So this guy in this position was looking through his periscope, trying to fire his machine gun off to the left front of the vehicle. So kind of a, an interesting setup. Of course, behind him is another fuel tank. So you had internal fuel, you had external fuel. Normally they would burn off that external fuel on the movement up. And then once they get into contact, they would switch to internal fuel tanks. Uh, batteries, electronics, so on and so forth. Uh, nothing real special or eye-catching back here. Just not a lot of room. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, well, here we are in the commander's position of the BMP2. Uh, as you can see, it's a tight fit. Uh, I actually couldn't get all the way in here because I couldn't get my legs over the gun controls. Uh, so just to point out a few of the major features. So, of course, starting down here by my left knee is the weapons control system. I don't read Russian, so I really can't explain in detail what everything means. Uh, then going up, this actual hopper here is the hopper for the spent cartridges. So they come out of the gun, they fall in, you discard them later. Uh, by my left hand is the ready box leading up to the coaxial machine gun that mounts here. And of course, over to the 30 millimeter auto cannon. Uh, and if I could get the turret to the gun tube to race them, I could show you a little more of that, but it's a little stuck right now. We'll fix that in the next episode. 
Uh, and then over to the Commander's Night Vision Viewer. Uh, normally it's on a race, so you can kind of look around. Uh, there's a, a corresponding searchlight out there with it that you saw earlier. Uh, and then over to the Commander's Sight for the main weapon and the controls for his weapon. What's interesting about these controls is both on this side, and you'll see the gunner station in, in a minute, on that side, it's pretty much the exact same controls. So regardless of what side you're in, you can perform the same basic functions of firing the weapon. Um, and also, another interesting little tidbit, when you look in here, and if you ever look inside of a T-72 or any other Russian tank, the controls are very, very, very similar. Uh, so if you can theoretically operate one, you can operate the other because it's still the same muscle memory. So going around the back side here, of course, your standard issue Russian radio. Uh, nothing super special, but this one's in really, really, really good shape. We got about four of these now. Been kind of uh, scrolling them away. Um, down here by my right knee is the ammunition feed system. So the ammo rides up between these bars and goes up into the gun. If you can kind of see that. So it's a, it's a, it's a fixed shoot here. It's a semi-flexible shoot up here to feed the rounds into the gun. And all your rounds are actually stored down here underneath my right foot. I actually got the cover down. So the rounds come, are stored under. They come around behind me into the main ready box right here. So you're feeding rounds actually from where the camera person is sitting <laughs> all the way around. Here is a rack for one of the anti-tank missiles. Uh, put it here because it's easy, easy, easy to get to. That way you can go up there and put the new cartridge in. Uh, it doesn't load like a sagger did. We could actually load it from inside. Uh, these here are so bulky, kind of like a tow missile. You actually have to get up there and click a new one into place. So with that being said, we'll move on to the gutter station. Okay, well, welcome to the BMP-2 gunner station. Uh, we've moved over here from the commander station. As you can see, it's a little less room than what the commander enjoyed on the right side. Uh, same basic setup, uh, control handles, just like on the commander's side. Uh, the gunner's sight, both daylight and IR, set slightly higher what the commanders were. Uh, still hard for us tall guys to get in there, but it's, it's possible. Uh, traversing mechanism for the turret, is here, uh, and then down on your left hand is your manual traverse for when these go out, and on your right hand is the manual elevation for when you can't do this anymore. So uh, over here is your turret azimuth indicator, lets the gunner look quickly at uh, in relation to the hole which way he's pointing. Uh, that way if he sees a target he can call it out and say, you know, I've got a target at 10 degrees, and the commander can check it out and even tell him to fire or not fire. Uh, so as far as that goes, the gunner station's a, a lot more simple. Uh, he can still reach the, the gun control panel down here, just like the commander can. Uh, he can still get to the radio behind here, maybe a little harder, and still get to the stored missile that's stored down between the, the two people. Uh, he does have all around periscopes, even though they're not in yet. Uh, that giving from left to kind of a, a, fr a front right view. And that's pretty much it with the gutter station. Okay. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not six foot, I'm about 5'10 or a meter 79 if you don't speak freedom units, but this is actually a lot more comfortable for me than for Bill is. And it's not so bad actually, you can reach everything kind of just fine. And it's quite a bit more comfortable for somebody that would be my height or below, so not so bad so far. <laughs> of course I said, this is the BMP2. It's the, the next version off the BMP series. Uh, now, they're already up to BMP-4. Now, the, the, the main difference is when you go from a BMP-2 to a BMP-3, they're wildly different vehicles. Uh, they look nothing alike. Uh, they actually, in the later versions, they went with the same 30 millimeter cannon, but they also paired it with a 100 millimeter cannon. Uh, but it's also a 100 millimeter low pressure gun, much like the 73 millimeter was, so you don't, you don't have a lot of recoil and blast and such. Uh, but for them, now it gives them an anti-tank and an anti-infantry capability in the main gun alone, paired with the AT-5 that they mount up top. 
Um, now, when you look at the difference between the BNP1 and the BNP2 and the BNP3 and the BNP4, they actually start getting a little smaller. Uh, their, their external sizes seem to grow, but their internal sizes seem to shrink. Uh, when you look at the BNP1, the guys in the back actually enjoy pretty decent room, but because it was only a small one-man turret, that's what gave them that room. Now they've grown this turret to a two-man turret, added in an ammunition handling system and, and radios and stuff like that. Uh, they're taking away room from their main purpose, which is to carry these infantry guys into combat and, and dump them off in contact. Okay, well, we're outside now. I wanted to cover a little bit of this top part uh, that we talked about inside and also talked about on the ground. Uh, this way you can actually see it. So, as before, you have the vehicle commander's hatch here, the gunner's hatch here, the squad leader's hatch here, and we'll talk about that a little more in a second, and then, of course, the driver's hatch on the front left, uh, and we'll be covering that next. So, starting with the commander's hatch, of course, we talked about that's his IR searchlight. It has its cover on right now. Uh, this is the cover for the commander's sight system that I pointed out earlier. Uh, going over, this is the launcher for the AT-5. Uh, slightly different than the AT-4 on the BMP-1. It was actually set forward and it was a missile. On an AT-5, it's just a tube, much like a tow is. Uh, and finally ending with the gunner's hatch, his daylight searchlight, and the gunner's sighting system that I pointed out earlier. So there's his periscopes. And as we go forward, this is where the 30 millimeter cannon comes out of the turret, the coaxial machine gun to the left of it, and of course the night searchlight with his cover on again off to the right so as we move forward now the whole area where the camera is currently taking up space this is all engine and transmission so on from the very front of the turret all the way to the edge of the front hull and then from the driver's hatch to all the way to the right is all engine and transmission and they get to that through different access points and of course the main door right there with the alligator armor on it so now going over here to the squad leader's hatch well, what i always found what makes this hatch interesting is there's a very small area going from here to the back so the guy that takes up this area if something were to happen to this vehicle and he can't get out that hatch uh, i.e a catastrophic hit they rolled over, whatever. He has a very slim chance of getting out because that is such a hard area to, to navigate to get out of here. Now he can get out through the, the driver's hatch, but if you're in a situation where that hatch doesn't open, you're gonna be in the same situation with the driver's hatch. So kind of a bad spot to be. You had the same hatch on the BMP-1, uh, and that guy actually had a searchlight that mounted right in front of his hatch that in turn blocked the main gun from traversing over to the left. It actually have to raise the gun up over it. Uh, so they got rid of that dead spot, uh, but it's still a really, really bad place to sit. So I'm gonna move on to the driver's station. So how in the hell are we gonna do this? Feet first, I surmise. Um, so welcome to the driver's position on the BMP2. Uh, right now I'm actually sitting in the seat for the squad leader I was talking about earlier. And as you can see behind me, with the turret right there, I've got a very small egress to the rear. Uh, so he also has an area here to fire his AK-47 using the same system as in the back. Uh, and imagine being the driver right here with your head right here and a guy firing his rifle on full auto six inches from your ear. So probably not conducive to good hearing. All right, so the driver station itself is very, very simple. Uh, so all around periscopes, so he can see from about the front right of the vehicle all the way around to a hard left. Interesting controls, kind of like a, uh, a bicycle. So push down, go right, push down, go left. Uh, standard pedal arrangement, gas pedal. Uh, brake and clutch. Everything else you see back there, uh, of course, once again, Cyrillic, there's a lot of valves uh, to control fuel flow, to control the trim vane up front, 
uh, just basically the nerve center of the vehicle. Uh, he also has a system down here, if you can see it, that lets him know at what inclination or degrees he's currently driving. So if the commander says, hey, I want you to drive at 30 degrees for 30 miles, all he has to do is watch that and then watch how, how long he travels or how far he travels to get to where he's going. Kind of a, a rudimentary navigation system. Not like what you had before where it's basically a computer screen that just points you in the right direction. Yeah, keep it simple. Yep. So, standard gauge setup, RPMs, fuel, uh, heat of the transmission, heat of the engine, you know, not much difference. Uh, circuit breakers across the top, uh, warning lights and such. Hatch control lever, which I won't do now. And of course, his seat. Now, once again, the seat is actually folded down. If I was sitting right here, right now, I would probably be at about above shoulder death late sticking up out of that hatch. So once again, made for, for rather short guys uh, to operate these vehicles. Uh, and also kind of a challenge to get in and out of. <laughs> I can barely look up and see the camera. Um, so. With that, that is the interior and exterior view of the BMP2. Yikes! <laughs> oh, that feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That was not built for you. I have problems. I got nothing but problems. Put that seat down a little bit, I think. I feel a bit exposed. <laughs> Flightly. Thank you guys so much for watching. Bill and I are out here at the National Armor Cavalry Collection, and if you want to see more of that, I have some links down below. Follow them on social media to see some more vehicles and more progress on the collection as it goes. Like and subscribe this video for more, and I'll see you in the next one.